Barry, would you like to come this way, please? And the technical guys will give you a, a hand. So I would like to introduce you to Barry, who is the CIO of Aradium. Now, this is a company I actually know a little about. They specialize in dig digital identity. And we've heard this afternoon a lot around the transformational process. I am intrigued to hear your take on it because um, my understanding is this is what you specialize in terms of helping customers through that digital journey so they have one seamless view. And the guys that you work alongside were instrumental in building um, the open banking the, at OBIE. So a huge amount of insight to share. Have you got a mic? Well, we are going to collaborate. You can have mine. Okay. I'm all hot. Thank you very much. You're okay. Let's just wait for the content. Do you want to share a little bit about sort of building on from what I said about the, the, the skill base you have? Yeah, absolutely. And, and how you've helped shape the market? Sure. Uh, it's great to be here. My name is Barry O'Donoghue. I'm a co-founding partner at Radium. We're a London-based consultancy. And open banking has been in our DNA from the start. We've built a business around open banking and PSD2. Uh, we've been the consultancy partner of choice uh, at the implementation entity. And my heritage really, uh, and the founders, we come from retail banking. 10 years at Barclays, at RBS, not just me, but uh, Society General, the London Stock Exchange, and we realized that digital identity was an area that needed some attention. And open banking, in, in our purview, was really a major digital identity program. So I'm gonna talk a bit about the potential to harness digital identity, power the connected economy. I'm gonna talk about it first in a B2B context, and separately in a uh, customer context and some of the challenges that the industry are facing currently. So just a bit about me. As I said, I'm an Irish guy. I live in Edinburgh, run a business in London, serving clients. Have I lost this? No. Serving clients in, in and around Europe and more globally. We've been working with the CMA9 banks um, and fintechs and industries really trying to capitalize on a connected economy and really use digital identity to enable that. Uh, open banking for us, when we mobilized in late sort of 2016, we had a CMA order. The open banking implementation entity was really sort of floundering, I'm quite unsure about how do we go about securing this? How do we sort of put in place a trust framework Hello, hello, testing. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Hello. Okay. Well, I'll move on anyway. We're talking a bit about open banking, the directory platform was a key part of that. So looking back briefly, because I just want to, you know, this has been a major um, piece of work. A lot of effort's gone in. We're sort of still at early stages, arguably. Um, but a lot of um, investment has gone on at the major banks in the UK and is going on around Europe currently. Um, and there's still lots to do, but we have some key foundation enablers that we can use to build further. Okay, so the regulation dates have come and gone. We're sort of two months past the September date, and we're in this sort of adjustment period to help largely the, the SEA um, journey in the merchant space. So just in terms of the context, in terms of business to business identity. So these are some of the constructs that as a player in Europe, you've got to deal with. So in, in the UK, prior to PSD2, we didn't have things like QTSPs, these trust services that the EIDAS legislation gives us. Um, we, we had national competent authorities, um, and we had to deal with how we established trust with TPPs and, uh, and amongst banks. Um, in the UK, we've, we've established a directory, a register. This was something that the, the CMA order envisaged, which was effectively a whitelist, but it was extended to deal with a lot more concerns. It was, it was extended to deal with organization identity, software identity, 
cryptographic keys and certificates, um, and the human contacts behind those organizations, and to make the ability for those organizations to establish themselves in the market quickly, right? So reduced barriers to entry so that they can get up and running quickly. The trust framework under, e under PSD2 involves EIDAS, as I mentioned, and that envisages TPPs being able to approach their local competent authority to perform regulated activities, to have an, an authorization number assigned, and with that, they can approach any QTSP in Europe, obtain an EIDAS certificate, and get up and running, knock on any bank's door, and say, let me in, I want to consume your APIs, please. No contracts, no other barriers. I've got my EIDAS, here it is. And to do that in a way that is, is API-based as well. You know, we, we heard from Rakuten earlier, navigating developer portals. That is not a model that scales well. You can't expect TPPs to be able to deal with all of the variability in, in developer ports because that's not standardized. So armed with an EIDAS certificate and using open international standards, it is possible to knock on that door in an electronic way and to get in immediately and to consume those payments and accounts APIs. And that's very, very powerful. EIDAS is one of the problem areas that the market is still adjusting to deal with. The established players that normally deal with certificate and TLS termination like F5 and Citrix, etc., cetera, um, haven't really caught up. We've brought a couple of things to market to help address that problem, to be able to accept and recognize these EIDAS certificates and process them. So just switching for a minute to talk about some of the um, consumer concerns in open banking. Open banking was envisaged as a pan-European framework for embedding financial services, for addressing payments, and for exposing accounts and transaction data. And really that's all about innovation and competition. Ultimately, they're the main drivers. Payments so far has been very low in its uptake. Why is that? That is because Strong customer authentication, or SCA, and the journeys for that have not worked well. They are too friction heavy. Cus consumers are not prepared to have redirects. They're not prepared to have lots and lots of steps involved in checking out at a merchant site. So there's a necessary, you know, there's a need to solve digital identity to enable payments. How do we do that? We have to use open international standards that are safe and secure, but are also frictionless or friction low in terms of um, a decoupled model that doesn't involve a redirect, where you get a push, for example, to your smart device that allows you to authorize very quickly and safely and seamlessly. The financial grade API standard has been specifically conceived, and Radium is a co-author of that, and we spend a lot of time getting that right with the industry to make sure that it was, and I think the clue is in the name, we didn't have a marketing pe person, but financial and the grade was added, added at the end. That doesn't mean it's just for finance. That means it's, it's ready for read, write, payments, APIs, but that's also applicable for other high value use cases. And the SIBA profile, which is part of FAPI, is the client-initiated back-channel authentication profile. This is a way to achieve authorization in a decoupled way, right? So you're not sent to your bank, you receive something out of band on your device that allows you potentially on a, a wearable to authorize a transaction or a payment. So that is a very powerful uh, proposition and it's something that needs to be invested in. Banks in the UK have not achieved that. Some of the neobanks have those journeys addressed, but the, the uptake, again, on the, on the major high street banks, which you know, account for 98% of the market, has not, has not materialized. So, the regulator and the regulations has not gone as far as to talk and address identity, digital identity. They talk about it in the context of strong customer authentication, but in the context of the APIs and the data payloads, 
The data is not attributable. That is a real problem because data without association to a real end user principle is limited in value. Knowing the user principle unlocks future and further value chains, such as, for example, recombinant data propositions, where you have data that's been consented to, which has been released, which in combination with other data allows and unlocks really un, you know, unforeseen use cases. And we can talk about that um, further, but that's, that's one of the things that's possible. Obviously with consent and with that, that um, explicit uh, consent of the customer. So identity could solve data attribution. Um, I recall, I was just to mention, a lead architect at the Royal Bank of Scotland Group at the time, this is in September, let's see, January 2018, and the years prior, and um, bringing read write payment APIs to, um, to market in that time. The identity token that comes as part of OpenID Connect, which is a standard that is now implemented across the UK market, and the decision about whether to absent or include who the identity token belong to, the first name, the surname, maybe a date of birth, maybe the address. Think about the potential if that information, which you're already plumbed into, was put into that token and the TPP or the third party had that information to work with. That is really, really powerful and valuable. Um, Consumers, so digital identity origination fatigue. Who thinks they've got or suffers from that problem? So by that I mean uh, credentials. So in your personal life, if you've got more than 10 sets of credentials, put your hands up. Just that many? How about 20? 40? 100? Some people still have their hands up. So that means we have a problem. And that is a problem in financial services. If every product that you wish to originate, you need to establish a new identity. Even where that product might be coming from a party that you already indirectly deal with. Maybe it's um, Lloyd's Banking Group. You're taking, maybe they're underwriting a loan for a new car with a lender that's a third party. So there's this nexus of relationships. The customer wants a loan to purchase a car. They're a customer of Lloyd's who's gonna underwrite that. And the third party, maybe it's Hitachi or somebody else, is, is gonna cut that. Again, origination of new products, first party or third party, could be enabled with digital identity to make that sign up more straightforward, so that's less friction, less steps. So digital identity really powers a digital and connected economy. Open banking is just one and really an early step. And it's a helpful one because embedding payments and financial services as part of a connected economy is an important first step. But that doesn't mean we stop there other areas of finance need to be addressed. They're not currently addressed, but the same principles, the same frameworks apply just the same. So open banking has been conceived, when we designed it, was very much geared for multi-industry support. And the UK government is looking at ways to apply those same learnings across pensions, across energy and across other open data initiatives to unlock that data, to empower customers uh, in, in a way that they're consenting to, to share their data and to unlock new value chains to promote innovation and competition. So trust that's made simple, you know, gives customers and also businesses confidence to interact safely. And that's where the standards that have been developed over the, over the last two, three years in conjunction with the industry, which we've 
aligned to international standards groups, including the OpenID Foundation, they really give us the bedrock to, s to, to build upon. And whilst the regulations have stopped with payments and accounts and transactions APIs, that's not to say we stop there. We've got to continue. We've got to build on those same foundations and to bring new propositions to market. Some, sometimes people term that commercial uh, premium APIs, but that's not the only way to do it. There's still an opportunity to, to bring new propositions to market built on the same frameworks and standards that have been put in place. I want to talk a bit about fintech, big tech, and just keeping an eye on LinkedIn or any uh, social media, you'll be aware that these companies are very active. Alipay, or Ant Financial, PayPal, and its Connect proposition, or Credit proposition, the Sign In with Apple proposition, Facebook, or Facebook Pay, which we've heard about in the media this week. Uh, Google and Google Pay. I think these, these announcements have just come this week alone on consecutive days in my feed. I don't know when you, you guys have seen them. WeChat. So ultimately, these players are platform players. They're also identity providers. Why have they invested in identity? Why have they aligned it with open international standards? Because they want to power and empower their customers, their platform, and their services. These guys are not stopping with just powering payments. They're also extending to lending. PayPal, Alipay, WeChat, they're writing 100 billion in lending in, in, in a month, in a year. So they are a big deal. We can't ignore them. To date, federal sort of um, fractional reserve banking that has been the dominant model has, won, has been one where I think um, Paul Rohan at the plenary on yesterday described as 363. You, you take deposits at 3%, you lend at 6%, and you're on the golf course at 3 so the store of value has traditionally been a bank account. The place where lending exists was traditionally and is traditionally on a balance sheet. These players are looking at that, they're eyeing that up, and they want that for themselves. And they're using international standards to good effect. Sign-in with Apple initially got it slightly wrong but they were receptive to feedback from the OpenID Foundation, and they aligned it with the Open International Standard, as in OpenID Connect. So all of these players are OpenID providers, or OPs for short. I could just as easily put up all of the high street banks in the UK alongside them. They are also OpenID providers. The difference is, these guys see the power of identity. The high street banks do not and unfortunately have stopped short of providing and becoming identity providers. And I know from, from, from speaking with banks that they've been reluctant to invest. They can't see that return. It's not tangible. If I invest in an identity platform and identity services, will I see a return? Will that result in some stickiness to me or does that just enable you know, my data, my identity data for my customers to be used with other providers. And again, Paul Rowan talked about yesterday, when you're investing in the platform ecosystem sort of business, you're enabling network effects. You're not investing, looking for a direct return on your bottom line from a first party proposition. You're looking at enabling your customers, your partners, and enabling ecosystem plays by investing and powering digital identity. That means safe, secure, simple and seamless for developers and for customers. And if you think of the, the, the context of, of Google and of Apple in particular with their device play, that becomes an extremely compelling,
powerful proposition. And they're starting with tie-ups with banks. I think uh, Google, I think, is with Citi. Um, I think Facebook, their pay solution, I think, is a PayPal Stripe thing. I think Apple is their card solution is one of the big, is it JP or BAML, one of the two. So they're starting there, and that's a nice way for them to enter the market. But are they going to stay there? I don't think so. So where are we with, with digital identity across Europe? In Norway, in Sweden, Belgium, there are bank ID uh, initiatives. Um, the UK, as I mentioned, have aligned with Open ID, but they've stopped short of providing digital identity. Banks are extremely well placed. They have a very significant set of digital identity data that they've gone through the expense and the effort to, to capture, to ensure is accurate, and to maintain. The plumbing, as part of open banking, has been put in place to obtain those identity claims in the same systems that they're already interacting with and to make them available. And there is a commercial market for digital identity. It unlocks value. There is a pay a, and a possibility to pay and to have an actual return on exposing digital identity. And I think becoming a true player in a platform and an ecosystem world requires you to get digital identity right for your customers. Requires it to make it easy for developers to come in on board and for your customers to perform strong customer authentication. The gov.verify void has left a bit of a gap in the UK market. I think there's definitely an opportunity for banks to step up. Or should we leave that vacuum to be filled by big tech? I just want to briefly talk about the future of the customer relationship. And that's one where it's a lot more multifaceted and dynamic. Certainly in the context of banking, banking has moved very dramatically from being an in-person, branch-based arrangement over the last couple of decades, moving to telephony, then to internet, now to mobile, with digital the dominant channel. A bank account has become a much more nuanced concept. Fintech is breaking and decomposing banking and traditional products that banks only provided. A bank account is a much more fluid, nuanced concept now. You only have to look at the advances in, in the sort of payment space, again, which is a daily announcement thing. It's hard to keep up. So establishing a digital identity for a customer that reflects their individual characteristics, their preferences, their relationships, who and what they are as a, as a child, as a student, as a parent, as a father, a mother, with a partner, with a business, as an elderly person. One of the, the banks we've been dealing with recently termed the three J's juniors, geriatrics, and joints. And this is something that they had not dealt with well in their mobile experience or in their sort of digital channels, and you had to visit a branch to do servicing of that. So it's important that you are able to deal effectively with the diverse set of circumstances that your customer, their individual characteristics. Digital identity needs to represent the human identity, and it needs to intrinsically understand that. It is not acceptable for customers to have to originate a new identity for another part of your business, for another product that you haven't got organized correctly because you've siloed, you've got a monolithic application where di digital identity is implemented per business line or per, per channel application. That has got to be sorted out. And I would also observe that having a sophisticated policy engine that can quickly understand and process all of the claims and all of the attributes that associate with a digital identity, 
so that you can be dynamic, you can be adaptive, you can understand and be, um, I think dynamic is probably the best word. So you, you, can, you can evolve, you can keep pace in the digital age and understand how APIs and all the API data and payloads interrelates with identity data so that you can make real-time decisions to enforce access control. So really, I think I'm just going to leave you with that. Digital identity powers digital business. And I think there's an opportunity to get this done. And the UK is very, very well placed to capitalize on that. Before Thank you, you for your time. Before you put your hands together, I would like you to um, ask Barry some questions because the slide, if nothing alone, on WeChat, Google, PayPal, that is a game changer, an absolute game changer. Um, please, what would we like to know? You have got a, an industry guru uh, on, the, on the stage here talking about unlocking the power of a digital ID. Have we got any questions? Oh, loads. There we go. Thank you. Can you say who you are and where you're from, please? All right, hi, uh, hi there. My name is uh, Kun, I'm from uh, Belgium, Cloudoki. Um, I was very curious um, uh, before you started to hear anything about digital twinning and uh, micro consent management, privacy management of uh, individuals and corporates alike. Is that something that you guys are already uh, actively uh, pursuing, uh, investigating, what's the stage of that? Yeah, good question. Um, consent as a concept, has received a lot of focus with obviously with GDPR. It's something that we've had to give uh, great attention to in the open banking security profile and standards, consent capture and enforcement. I think uh, currently the, the consent concept and its place in the delegated authorization model where you're delegating a third party access to consume your data, that's pretty well understood and is widely adopted now. I think there is the potential for consent as a service, consent receipts. And I think in the context of open data and recombinant data propositions, I think the open data exchange is an example where bringing data from different sources together with consent, um, you know, does, you know, really unlock some new value chains, I think. Um, but being able to scale consent management is a, is a problem that I think the industry's got to still solve. And I think we've got some interesting thoughts on that. I, I have a question. If, if, if we looked at the figures this morning around adoption, we've now got 140 million uh, open banking calls a month. A few of those will be tests, but still the, a huge increase. You've just talked about scale. How, yeah. do we, how do we map the two together to move forward to enable this sector to grow? Um, okay. So scale is a function for me, a uh, couple of things. Firstly, standards, because as a TPP, if I want to enter the market and there is a clear, unambiguous standard, as there is in the UK, then it's, it's easy for me to anticipate what I need to spend to invest to get this done. You can kind of say, I think it's probably three months' work. We've got this team. I think we need about this much money. And you can, you can pretty reliably and confidently invest and get that in integration done once, and knowing you've done it once, achieve mass um, integration with all of the players. So standards are key for that. Uh, the platform, if you think of the, I guess, the infrastructure, um, open banking as a platform is cloud native. It's in the AWS cloud. It's been designed to scale and to grow, and it's very much built on in a loosely coupled way with standards that are very, very lightweight. And we are fully ready to be able to sort of grow uh, with the industry. And we expect that exponential growth that Chris Michael talked about earlier to continue, absolutely to continue. And I think when payments get sorted out properly and SCA gets sorted out, we will see that. So post-March? Yes. We'll hold you to that. OK, another question, please. Um, just a question about this idea of a unified digital identity. I'm just curious as to how you think that could 
sort of work in reality? Would that be, I mean, you just use the terms consent as a service. Could that sort of come hand in hand with digital identity as a service or just what your thoughts are on that? Sure. Um, so I think digital identity is probably more into a mind map to talk about the concerns that digital identity encompasses in and, and for whom uh, the different types of entities that it encompasses. But ultimately, you're talking about authentication, authorization, and identity management, and credentials, and you know even things like redirect your eyes, client IDs. Um, so I think in the consumer context, digital identity, um, I'm tr I think I'm losing thought, actually. Train of thought, what, what was the precise point? How do we, still got the mic? Federated ID. Federated, yeah, so I guess it's probably relevant to talk about the need for, I think, probably cooperation, potentially. I don't think it needs standards. I don't think it needs a regulator. I think it needs some of the big players to take the step. Yeah. I think the standards actually are pretty clear in terms of what, if you were thinking about it right now, about what, what do you think the sweet spot is, what do you think the right solution looks like, I think you could make that decision right now. Um, and I think, for example, in the UK market, I think what we would see is with one taking that step, another would follow. I absolutely believe that that's the case. And I think by proving out some of the commercial models um, in terms of value transfer and commercializing identity, I think that would help too. So I think th that's my current thinking on it. Thank you. We've got time for one last question. Uh, where's, oh, I'm going to make it two because you've put up your hand very fast. Thank you. Could you say who you are and where you're from, please? Give yourself a name check. Sure thing. My name is Garode, and I work with a compliance service called Consentus. And my question was in relation to PSD2 was built around and very much was designed for European banks and European financial institutions, which is somewhat, you might call it a national solution, but technology is a global application. And having lived in China, I've seen that most of the mobile payment technology and those things are really shaping the market and actually, you know, what China does, the European companies are now following. To what degree going forward do you think regulators are going to begin looking at American and Chinese uh, payment apps and solutions as a way of shaping the regulations for Europe? Uh, good question. Thank you very much. Um, well, I think, again, Paul, I'm going to recite your site back to Paul. The sort of inward only looking and not being outward facing and looking at what others, other markets are doing is would be would be uh, foolish, but I think what what I've observed, you know, the open banking movement is a global one. The cradle of that has been in the European Union, and I would say that the UK has very much been in the palm of of that and has been spearheading the movement. And what we see is that this movement, going as far as Latin America and Asia Pacific, the Emirates, and further afield, is they're looking at. Europe and they're looking at what's, what does good look like. And actually what they're doing is they're taking the benefit of the learning, they're looking at the UK I think is a good example of success in that we have a flourishing TPP community that's scaling well um, and they're looking to replicate that success. So I, I think that's, that is a model. I think EIDAS as a framework I think uh, is limited in how well it covers many, you know, obviously the consensus solution I'm familiar with. Um, I think there are a lot of concerns that are not properly addressed. The idea that you can obtain a digital certificate and, and, and show up and say, let me in, I'm an organization, fine. What about the software concerns? It doesn't consider APIs really at all. And this technologically neutral stance that the Europeans have taken has really hampered things. And I, I think they'll really struggle to catch up even in the sort of 18 months to two years that, you know, that we maybe regard. Part of a bigger debate then, isn't it? Yeah. We've got time for one uh, last question. So if you could take the mic, give your name and your company, please. Uh, Salash Panjar from Orwell Group. Um, I think my question is, in a country without a national identity scheme and uh, all this conversation of crypto privacy conversation, is society ready for a digital identity where banks and other institutions 
very, very few, I think exceptionally, would have even a single customer view within their own, within their own infrastructure, much less trying to bear the costs of, and the risks associated with attributing a person's individual identity at the level of risk that you're purporting. This isn't just a, an API technology problem is what I'm trying to say. So I think for providers, for banks in underwriting digital identity, putting claims and, s and standing behind them, you know, you, the analog that we have today with screen scraping, uh, where effectively you have TPPs ultimately relying on the printed, you know, Joe blogs and taking that as a given and relying on that information. So actually, if you think of the current status and the potential to massively improve that, I think you know, by including some claims in a standard format, using an international standard like uh, from OpenID or the Vectors of Trust, with levels of assurance about how um, confident the provider of that data is in, in, in it being accurate, and a liability model that underpins that, I think that would be fine. I think that still helps a lot. Um, are consumers ready for that? Well, I think as you heard everybody in the room, having a 100 plus personal credential sets that you need to, to deal with and manage um, I think there's a great opportunity for banks to help reduce that significantly with high-grade digital identity, open standards, um, and, and reusing that relationship.